Leclerc. It's Leclerc. Charles Leclerc. Welcome to Negative Camber, the motorsport show brought to you by Pro Karts Race Centre. Far enough back, he's going to make the lunge down the inside. The ultimate pit stop. The safety car is coming in. Fueling your passion for motorsport. With an emotional moment well that means everything. All of the latest results, analysis and interviews. Roar the drivers on to the final lap of this race. I'm Jamie Lemura, motorsport enthusiast, historian and media presenter. And I'm Lee Harrison, motorsport professional, Sprint Master Karts race driver and Formula One alumni. Welcome to another episode of Negative Camp of the Motorsports Show. I'm Jamie Lemura and with me is Lee Harrison. G'day mate, how are you? Yeah, look, not bad. Uh, it's been a public holiday Monday, so you can't really complain with that. But um, yeah, surviving and uh, trying to stay cold and cool in this hot, hot weather that we're having here. Harry, I've got to pull you up on something. Uh -oh. The danger of social media is when you post stuff that is just absurdly crazy you get pulled up on it what in god's name were you doing at southern go-kart club <laughs> yesterday morning in a 40 degree day in a track that would be infested with blowflies it would be stinking hot and you're going to there to test what dude what what the hell's going on Let's have a head. Let's have a check up from the neck up, mate. Come on. Um, well, hang on, hang on a second, because I've got this covered. I've got. This, okay. Uh, it's going to be a. It's going to be too much of a task, really. Let's see if I can do this. Nah, look, look, I can't. It's going to go pear shaped. <laughs> well, what I was, what I was going to do there is take you back yeah. into the into the sim room and show you my vast array of trophies and say the grind never stops. And it's because of those moments where I'm at the track in the 40 degree heat and at the, you know, dealing with the blow flies on a track that's not ideal that I have all of those trophies in my closet at the moment. The only grind that exists in my life right now, mate, is coffee. That is it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't give a shit. <laughs> um, so you had the team out there clearly and you were getting some laps in. Yeah, actually I was doing some coaching, so... Um... Yeah, we got obviously got Mount Gambia coming up this weekend and uh, just getting some final laps in and doing a few bits and pieces before, before the big weekend. Yeah, cool. So the the full team's making the uh, the trek up or are you um you going you actually gonna have a steer yourself? No, I was gonna have a steer. Um, but Nick's wife has come down with COVID this week, so my go kart's not gonna be ready, it's not gonna be built. Um so yeah, I'm uh, I'm gonna going to be spinning spanners. We've got Cody racing two classes. We've got Hudson racing, and I think Dom's going to come across as well. So I've yep. got a few carts out there, and I'll just uh, yeah be getting my hands dirty. Unfortunately, unless something comes up between now and then, but entries closed tonight. I don't really feel like paying two hundred dollars to enter a cup uh, festival state cup round. So I'm not going to enter a late. Is that how much? Oh, okay. So I was going to say. So that's the late fee. It's two hundred dollars. Yeah. Jesus yeah. Christ. Okay, hundred dollars up until tonight, and then tomorrow onwards. I think tomorrow till Thursday, it's two hundred bucks entry fee. Jesus, that's a fair way to uh, get your entry in on time. Two hundred smackers. That's just what about they tell set you. of tires. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Wow. Yeah. Now, I, I, uh, before we get over to the main core of the show, which is obviously Formula One, um, I bumped into the other week at JK Tuning. And you're a little bit hot under the collar in regards to uh, the the racing format this year for well, what they've selected so far for the Festival State Cup, which, uh, well, I mean, first time in my brief go-karting career, it's a timed event literally across every heat and qualifying session as well. And uh, fair to say that that's stirred some interesting debate. And I'm assuming that you're not overly keen on it. No, 100%. I'm not. And like, I don't know where the idea came from. There was no no voting that took place. There was no message to the members, to the people that make these races and attend these races. You know, what? like this is what they were thinking. I just don't understand what for. Um, what is the... Are, are we that pressed for time? Like if we're that pressed for time, make the races a little bit shorter and do it all in one day. Like I just, I just don't... I just don't understand it. We're still going to go up there and spend you know, Friday night, Saturday night, and we're not going to get home until well well and truly after dinner on Sunday. So mm. what what does this achieve? Um, we've always raced to a lapse, 
a lap mm. count and yeah. there's not been anything wrong with it. So, um, yeah, it's just, just a bit weird. I don't like it. Mm. Like we don't, we don't do it at the world championships. We don't do it at the nationals. We don't do it at any other race meeting. So why are we doing it at this one? Yeah, it's, it, it's an interesting one. Like I, 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 I was, when I said to you that I wasn't, uh, I wasn't sure, and it was my naivety of the concept. I, I liken it to, uh, for me, it's a, it's a case of just imagine if you had a really like a full course yellow. You've travelled all the way that out, out there to Mount Gambier. You got a full course yellow, and you've got to go slowly around the track. And if they're only seven minutes long, that's what two laps under caution and three quarters of the race is done to pay a hundred dollars entry fee and then go to. $200 if you're late to potentially have a final compromised because it's time-based. I'm not sure a bang for buck is, is, is really there for mind myself. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I don't understand it. I mean, I'm like you, if they're, if they're talking about time pressed, there's certainly other things that they could do. Um, and I, I look at it this way, like even just the combination of the four stroke grids at the moment, I think it's ludicrous as well. If that's, that's the path that they're going down considering the numbers that the 4SS class still repeatedly gets is higher than probably even restricted in many cases. So, and if they come down to oh, it's a time thing, well, you're only really losing the Supermax class and you can combine the lights and mediums together because they're equivalent to speed. So to be honest with you, I don't even buy the time factor myself and we're in the arguably the slowest class on the track. So, um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to see if a few of the Carding SA officials do listen to this that they would be happy to sort of provide their input as to why it's done what it's done and this is not about stirring the pot at the end of the day but it's not the officials it's not the officials Mm. it's the festival state cup series organizers organizers that have made the decision so it's a group of people that are on the festival state cup committee i suppose i think it is that um that have made this decision and i don't know like i don't know where they got their intel from that this would be a good idea but uh, the officials the officials just rock up and do their job. They run the race meeting to the supplementary regulations. That's their job. Um, to yeah. the, the to the rules that are written in the series standings, and they've got to look the, look through that with the the actual competition rule book, and then they run it to the supplementary regulations. So the officials not really got a part in this. It's just yeah, the festival state cup organising committee. Yeah, I'd love to hear what the um, what the reasoning behind it would be. To be honest. Um, I mean, I was having a chat with a driver offline earlier in the week when we were talking about the four-stroke mix grid, like the one combined grid. And um, I'd sort of remarked to the driver, look, you've got to understand it's written in the Karting Australia regulations that four-stroke class is actually meant to be fastest driver to slowest driver and all the classes are actually combined. And they actually run the same format at the Ultimate Club Driver event towards the end of the year that you and I have both participated in the past as well. So the reality is, is that you could look at it as, well, it's prepping you for that. You know, having said that though, um, with the vast experience of drivers and inexperience of drivers out there, um, yeah, sometimes I think le- less can sometimes be more in regards to better racing, less chance of carnage. That actually increases the speed of the day to a degree because all you're gaining is one heat with a class. So, you know, it, it is it really that, I don't know, uh, but uh, I encourage Festival State Cup committee members to come and, and have a chat and let's um, let's nut out the reasons for this. So is it going to sit for the whole season, I think, or can they change it? I don't know. I think uh, once, it's, once it's been done for the first round, it's got to stay the same. And does every track get the same amount of minutes per heat race? So like when we go to Minardo, say it's going to be a minute per lap. Is that only going to be a seven lap race? But then when we go to Barossa and it's a 24 second lap, are we going to be doing 17 lap heat races? Like, what? Like, yeah, I don't know. Who knows? Yeah. Well, geez, if they run the time race at something like Monado, surely it's got to be the B track. It's the shortest track of the lot. Surely. They won't, they won't run that for Festival State Cup. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's probably more exciting than the Formula One race that's actually happened over the weekend. So it's. <laughs> um, yeah, if put it, this is going to be a long twenty twenty four, mate. If this keep uh, this keeps going, I tell you, I think it's going to get more exciting. But yeah, if you listen to what the pundits said after another dull Saudi F one Grand Prix, it was uh, yeah, how dull would it have been would it have been if Stroll hadn't crashed? Uh, 
anti-racing Magnuson gives life to a race that sparked out early. Um, and yeah, we get treated to a poor race like that. And we've got all this off track drama happening. Like it just doesn't, it doesn't seem like the, uh, the story is all meshing together. We're sort of got one thing happening off track and then a boring product on the racetrack. It almost feels like that Netflix are actually scripting all this drama in the background to actually justify <laughs> another season of drive to survive because it's for the, if it's for the on track stuff, they won't have a huge amount of content at least for a first place at I this think- stage. I think it's going to get better and like the race in the midfield is pretty interesting i say the midfield but it's really from sort of fourth and fifth onwards to tenth um and there, there's some spice there but yeah saudi arabia doesn't lend itself to the kind of racing that that we need i even said to shay while we we're watching the grand prix it's like such a boring track like average speed of 155 mile an hour um no hard braking zones it's all follow the leader kind of stuff I just I don't know if you've seen photos of the new track that they're looking at getting into in Kadia. Um, that's going to be an absolute epic, epic track. Bit of everything, some high speed stuff, but some slow speed stuff as well. And you know, yeah. that's that's what you need. Long straights into long braking zones. That's what makes passing happen. And that's why we saw, you know, Las Vegas is good, Baku is good, um, even though they're on street tracks. But yeah, Saudi is just yeah, they dumped a track in there so they could get into the market. Yeah, it definitely feels like it. I mean, if, oh God, not even Hockenheim in its long straights back in the day was was dull. But yeah, there's probably been what really one, maybe two Saudi Grand Prix that you might sit back and say, yeah, I'd watch that again. 2021 in particular because of the title fight and the battle between Leclerc and Verstappen in 2022. So um, outside of that, it's just been a DRS train the whole way through. And with the cars literally from second placing constructors all the way down being more evenly matched outside of red bull the racing is somewhat interesting but if you can't break that drs train if you want to call it that with outright pace you're in for a long day yeah they just drs train just makes for boring racing as well because everyone's getting the help off of each other and the person in front's generally got the lowest downforce setting on so they get you know enough speed in a straight line to hold everybody off or um yeah just yeah, it just makes for boring racing yeah, I don't know whether you saw there was a little film clip that I uh, bumped into when I was preparing for the show for tonight, and it was actually a animated overlay of Verstappen, Leclerc, Alonso, and Perez's qualifying lap, their best laps, and it was actually interesting to see that Verstappen out of the two Red Bulls was the uh, was actually gaining so much more time from corner exit, and that gave him good momentum going all the way through the straight and the fast bits in some cases, nearly two to three car lengths. And so drivers like Alonso and Leclerc, who were traditionally stronger uh, under brakes, would make up some of that deficit. But straight line, especially from corner exit and maybe the first third of a straight, Verstappen was just braining them. Like it was almost like he was almost running a low aerodynamic setting on his rear wing and could afford to do it. Not even Perez was able to make up uh, that ground and he's in the same car. It was just smoothness through the corner, right? Like it's just momentum carrying and that's what you need on higher speed tracks like this is you just need to keep the momentum up. And when your car is glued to the track like his is and you're confident in that car, you can you can keep that momentum up, you know. Um, he gets it all done quite early in the race. It's all, all said and done within the first couple of laps. He's out of DRS and then he's sort of just saving everything. He doesn't have to push too hard. He can roll, he can do all the things he needs to do, but the car's Mm. set up, it's on rails for him. It's like being on a slot car track. He just has it dialed and, um, yeah, unfortunately, no one's going to catch him for a little while yet. Yeah, exactly. I think uh, at this rate, as I said, we're uh, we're looking at a mid-season title that'll be wrapped up sooner rather than later. So let's just hope that we start to get some competition from Melbourne onwards and at some point, Red Bull reliability and, and things, maybe the team implodes internally and that will start to put things under under a bit of disarray with everything that's been going on. So, yeah, interesting stuff. All right, so we'll start with what happened at the beginning of the weekend. And I guess we had the simmering after effects of the Christian Horner Red Bull Verstappen drama now, where even Yoss is starting to throw his weight around, which is what we covered uh, last week. But these Mercedes rumours are getting stronger and stronger to a point now where Christian Horner's actually turning around and say, well, hey, if he wants to leave, let him leave. And that's like, well, I reckon 12 months ago, that, that wouldn't have happened. 
I don't I don't necessarily agree. I think it's it's always been a case. I don't I don't think Max would have said or even entertained that twelve months ago. Mm. But I think Christian's the kind of person that's like if he wants to go and do something, let him go and do it. But um yep. I still I still don't see Max entertaining these rumors. He still said like Red Bull is where his heart is, it's where they've given him all the opportunities, come up through their their ranks um as one of their drivers and they've still got the best car so why would he want to leave and um you know toto's made it abundantly clear that if max chooses that he wants to come to mercedes then he's happy to have him but hmm. they they can't do anything more and unless they build a good car he's not going to come across the across the divide so um look the journalists need to write something about Max Verstappen, and if that's what they've got, then then that's it. But I, I would rather they write about how he's up till whatever time in the morning playing iRacing on a gaming controller in his hotel room rather than in Mercedes rumours. Well, you, you literally read my mind because I think to myself, he is so far in cruise control right at the moment that on a Grand Prix weekend, he's got the time to sort of sit back at 3 o'clock in the morning Saudi time to sit there and play a game and not know whether he's on wet weather tires or not, which was actually quite funny. But um, yeah, put it this way: if he was in the, th- he wouldn't be doing that back in 2021. I can tell you now, when he was in the thick of a title fight, no, no chance at all. Hundred percent. I did see a funny meme the other day with a photo of him that said, uh, "Professional sim racer takes time out on his weekends to win Formula One races or something like that." And yeah, it's. Um, <laughs> Between that and playing FIFA, uh, he's he's having a good time. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, and that's the thing. It's like, what sort of a what sort of a message would that send to the rest of the pit lane? Like, that would be the biggest slap in the face that any of the competitors would get. Going, wow, we're here busting our nut, going through data, going through telemetry, staying until two or three o'clock in the morning with the engineers, and this bloke's playing computer games. Yeah, but I mean, when you're on, you're on, and. Mm. Uh, yeah, like I've said, just goes to show how good the sim racing is. So it's a good, good tool for learning and that's why I play so much of it. <laughs> oh, dear. Dear, oh, dear. Well, yeah, you, know, you actually probably would have been better off playing sim than going to the go-kart track in 40-degree heat, melt tyres, melt your kids, melt their, melt their racing overalls. Can do both. Swap flies. Go to, go, to the the track, go to the track until lunchtime and then come home and play sim in the afternoon. <laughs> how, the, how are the arms after going like this the whole time with flies everywhere? No, actually, the flies, the flies weren't too bad. There was a nice breeze out of Bolivar in the morning, so um, it didn't actually oh, wow. get unbearable until about 11, quarter past 11. So yeah. that was when we sort of called it quits, but even the flies weren't too bad, which was surprising for Bolivar. Yeah, very surprising for Bolivar. So, uh, yeah, we'll... Uh, Mate, I, I applaud you because I would have melted, I can guarantee you that. A huge thank you goes out to our podium partner, ProCarts Race Centre, and our incredible sponsors. Your partnership allows us to continue bringing you this show and dive deeper into the world of motorsports. If your business adds value to the motorsport community, get in touch with us to become a Negative Camber partner. Ready to turn your karting dreams into reality? Look no further than ProCarts Race Centre. Imagine hitting the track in the cart of your dreams, a ride that matches your budget and aspirations perfectly. With our pre-loved kart sourcing service, we make it happen. Our experienced team isn't just about mechanics, they're dream builders. We meticulously hand-pick each cart, ensuring reliability, performance and sheer exhilaration. Whether you're a seasoned racer looking for an upgrade or a newcomer stepping into the world of karting, we're your pit crew, your partners in racing dreams. Get ready to feel the wind in your hair, the thrill in your heart and the victory at your fingertips with ProCarts Race Centre, where dreams truly come to life. Visit ProCartsRaceCentre.com.au or pop in for a chat at 30 Research Road, Paraka. ProCarts Race Centre, fueling your dreams, igniting your potential. Now, Carlos Sainz, appendicitis. But I tell you what, Ollie Beerman, wow, what a debut. Could you could you've asked for anything better, really? Yeah, and even Fred Vasseur came out and said that uh, 
yeah, he matched her unrealistic expectations and had a pretty faultless weekend, qualifying for 11th and finished 7th. Um, you know, jumping out of the F2 car into the F1 car, it's not it's not a huge step. And I think I think it's more of a, um, a notch in the cap for Formula 2 to show how good the drivers are that are coming out of that category, that if you put them yeah. in a car that's decent, they can perform straight away. So it's mm-hmm. sort of a notch in the cap to show how good Formula 2 is as a feeder category. Um, I guess the only main difference is really the, the G-forces and, and the physicality of the race. And obviously, Behrman uh, came out in the, in the press overnight and said that he was pretty spent. He had to have Lewis help him get out of the car. And, um, you know, that was a pretty surreal moment for him. He's grown up watching Lewis win his seven world titles and to earn their yeah. respect with such a good drive. Um yeah, it's probably he's probably still pinching himself, but what a way to to put your case forward to be, you know, whether you want it or not, to be in the frame for a half seat next year, um, when when contracts come up for negotiation. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you said, and then also I guess I look at it this way that what it shows is that the current driver academy setup that a lot of the top teams have got in regards to racing in the F two, the sim work all that sort of physical and mental preparation as well. He's he's put in a stint. I mean, I, you can remember the times when, say, Giancarlo Fisichella, Luca Padoa were uh, filling in for the likes of Felipe Massa when he had his, um, his season-ending crash all those years ago, for example. They were test drivers for Ferrari. They were running laps around Fiorano. They'd go back out onto the track and be absolutely smoked, like for a point where poor Luca Padoa, who's actually a quality driver, you know, back in the day, it one it ruined his career, but then two, he almost became a joke at the paddock. Well, Sadly enough, rule putting Fizzy into that is probably a little bit unfair. He he did pretty reasonable and almost made a, a case enough for him to make a comeback in Ferrari colours. But yeah, Badoa definitely. Um, I think <clears throat> one of the races was his. He was at Spa or something, and he he binned it in the first lap of the race or qualifying or something. And um, yeah, yeah, so. I think yeah, a bit unfair putting Fizzy in that. He did he did pretty well in Ferrari colours, but yeah, it's um, a, a tough seat to go into. It's a mm. pressure cooker, um, yeah. and for all the people that you know, how good did Behrman do? Blah blah blah. Um, imagine if it was Lewis Hamilton that they were throwing into the car. How good would he have done? Would he have been up there fighting Charles for the last step on the podium, um, or would he have only been as good as Behrman? Um, how much more does that car have in it if a rookie? can go in there and, and be, you know, seventh on debut at such a tough track. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see. Well, it was enough to get Carlos Sainz out of the uh, out of hospital a day after having appendicitis surgery and stumble his way into the pit lane and actually sit or stand next to uh, Ollie Beerman's father and John Elkin in the pits and watch the race. Now, why Carlos did that? I'm assuming he's had medical clearance from, you know, from the hospital to let him out and, and go through. Not that I've ever had appendicitis surgery, so <clears throat> what would I know? But, um, yeah, wow. I mean, to, to, to go in there and clearly from all the footage you've seen, he's in discomfort. But that's someone that's trying to make a statement to get a seat for next year if he hasn't got one lined up. But also to the, the performance of Beerman was such that, you know, it dragged Carlos there. He had to be there, you know. So, um, yeah, I think it's because really, to be honest, I mean, Ferrari don't have to actually see Carlos Sainz out for the rest of this year if they don't want to. No. You know, if Beerman's, you know, but they're like, well, we're not needing you next year too. So that was a statement on both both sides, I think, from Carlos himself. But then also, I think, uh, keeping Beerman on his toes as well to a degree and also management with Ferrari too. I think they're not going to pull Beerman out of his Formula 2 ride like he put it on pole for the for the uh, F2 feature race and qualified there. So they're not going to rip him out of Prima because they've got contracts in with Prima and all that sort of stuff. So if, uh, if Ferrari were going to do that, they're going to be spending money hand over fist. Um, I think Carlos's drive is pretty safe, but yeah, I mean, I've not had appendicitis surgery either. I can imagine it wouldn't be very comfortable, but if you're good enough to get up and walk, like I would rather be at the track than be watching from the, the sanctity of my hotel bed or my hospital bed as well. So, um, yeah, yeah, you know, you've got to do what you've got to do and you show your support for the team. It probably probably means a lot to the fans and the Tifosi that he's he's still doing that, uh, even though he was he was not well. Lionhearted, mate. That's what it's all about. 
Sure. <laughs> Let's run through the results, shall we? Uh, so Max Verstappen first, Sergio Perez second. He closed the gap this time. It was only 13.6. So he's made an improvement on Sergio only. Charles Leclerc third, uh, Oscar Piastri fourth, Fernando Alonso fifth, George Russell sixth, Holly Beerman, which we've covered in seventh, Lando Norris eighth, Lewis Hamilton ninth, and Nico Hulkenberg in tenth. Daniel Ricciardo, they're still looking for him. He finished 16th, one lap down. So based on that, I'll move a little screen over here and we'll cover each team in a broad sense just to sort of get a bit of a snapshot of everything. But uh, Red Bull, second one, two, perfection. Can't top that. So, um, you know, not the quite perfection. Been set. They didn't get fastest lap because Charles stole that on the last lap. We did a thing right. That's great. <laughs> so it's just just one one championship point less that Max had to get. So we've we've taken something back. So it's, it's kept us in the Huntley shit. I mean, bloody hell. So um, you know, instead of the championship ending in Hungary, we might push it out to Spa. Yeah. So sure. uh, yeah, exactly. So Leclerc finished third. I, I think probably about as good as he could get. To be honest. I, I mean, he fought to get into second spot at the start of the race, but with the pace of the Red Bulls and DRS, it was only really a matter of time. Um, probably lost a little bit of ground when he fell back behind to fourth spot uh, behind Piastri after the Norris crash in the pits. But third was Stroll. probably... Oh, Stroll. Yeah, sorry. And um, that was probably about as good as it was going to get, yep. to be honest. So top job from Ferrari there. Piastri, well... Top drive, I thought. Made Lando look a bit second rate, but we knew that. And uh, Oscar is uh, putting his case for top Aussie on the grid, but also um, starting to lay the foundations to take over lead driver for McLaren because I guarantee this, he will win a race before Lando Norris. Yeah, look, I don't uh, I don't doubt that. It was a pretty faultless drive, but he was also quicker than Lando in Jeddah last year as well. So just repeating the same from last year, it'll be interesting to see how they go in Australia. Um, we did sort of say that they were going to be a lot better uh, at the free-flowing Saudi track versus um, being at Bahrain, stop-start. So Australia should suit them well as well with the changes to the track that they've made in recent years. Uh, I expect to see... Both of them cars fighting for fourth, fifth, sixth, somewhere around there. I think they're easily the third fastest car on the track at the moment, um, behind the Ferrari and in front of the Mercedes. Um, so, yeah, maybe a couple of retirements and we might see Oscar on the podium at his home Grand Prix. Yep, absolutely. And uh, I think if there's a year to do it, and the fact that McLaren are so much better this year than what they were comparative to the same time last year, I think your forecast is right. I think that home ground advantage or that spur on from the home crowd might just uh, see Oscar rattle the tree a little bit. Um, we've covered Lando as well. Now, actually, speaking of Lando, your thoughts on his start and the jump start. That wasn't quite a jump start. <laughs> yeah, look, it looked pretty ominous on the on the replay footage. And when it slowed down to the 1,000th of a second, it looks, looks pretty gnarly. But he obviously rolled, stopped, and then got going again. Um, and I think the big thing to take out of it was that the um, FIA-issued transponder um, didn't register as a jump start, and that is the only valid parameter to decide whether or not a car has done a jump start. Um, yep. So the stewards did review positioning and marshalling system data and the video and determined that the video appeared to show that he had moved, but um, he did bring it to a stop. Um, and Article 48.1A of the sporting regulations states that judgment of a jump start can only be made off of the FIA issued transponder. So, because that didn't show a jump start, and that's a trans like that's a signal that's drilled into the track in, right. inside of each pit box. There's a, a sensor drilled into the track, um, mm -hmm. and so that transponder did not, um, I guess, go over that sensor or didn't register on that sensor. Um, so yeah, he, he got away with it. With, um, speaking of the transponders, I don't know whether you do know, but with the F1 cars, you know how we've got our transponders in karting where it's plonked up against somewhere on the chassis row and it's like a little sort of block gadget. 
F1 cars would have something similar, wouldn't they? Or they've got like, just like a magnetic strip that triggers as they go over the uh, start-finish line. That's very, very similar, but it's all GPS coordinate based. So all of the timing loops get um, uh, laser scanned into the timing system and GPS coordinated. And then the, um, then the, the transponder is like a like yeah, really, really high profile GPS sensor um, so that if it stops and it doesn't reach a certain point in time and that's down to like something like 20 or 25 sectors in a Formula 1 track. So if a car doesn't make it to that sector in the right amount of time via GPS data, it instantly yeah. triggers to race control that there's been an incident somewhere or that car has, has come down to a, a slow speed. Mm, mm. Hence why in, say, Viet Supercar Commentary Land, you hear about things like micro sectors and stuff like that because they can see those timing loops, whereas us, the viewers, don't have that access at all. So, yep, yeah, makes correct, sense. correct. Yeah, they, they, you know, we can get onto Natsoft and have a look at sort of four intermediate splits, five intermediate splits for most races. But, um, yeah, in, in TV land, you're looking at sort of yeah, 10 to 12 in supercars and, yeah, heaps more in, in um, in Formula One, I mean, you see it every now and then. They bring up the data over the course of a lap where two drivers were quicker or slower than each other, and that's yep. how many sectors the GPS is broken up into for the for the transponder as well. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Uh, Mercedes, where are they at right now? Well, I think they've got a fundamental issue with their car, and it's just not performing in the high speed corners. You know, they've gone with a, a lesser wing so the car's pretty slippery in a straight line but i think that's sort of giving them a bit of a struggle when they're trying to go through the high speed sectors of the track and at a track like saudi where most of the corners are medium to high speed you need you need that extra downforce so um yeah they've uh, they've got a bit of a fundamental issue there it's it's fascinating isn't it a team that could literally do no wrong for seven seven years and then since 21 with the FIA mandated the change of the floor and they did eventually find their way back, but more on the engine power side rather than the chassis to then go through three straight years of just pure design malfunction. Let's call it that. It's probably the best word to describe as just, it's just been incredible, you know, but it also shows the impact of the salary cap where they can't buy them themselves out of trouble anymore. I don't well, even... they, they do. Yeah. I don't even think they could buy themselves out of trouble. Like the 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 only way to get the, anyone out of trouble right now is to buy Adrian Newey. The yeah. the only reason that Red Bull is so fast is because we've gone back to ground effects, and Adrian Newey is the ground effect master. Um, mm. There's no you know you take you take Red Bull out of it out of the equation completely. We're not having such a conversation about how bad Mercedes have been. You know, they're still the yeah. second best car. They're still, you know, fighting for wins and fighting for podiums. If we take Max and Sergio out of it, mm. their car's not horrible. It's just yeah. horrible when compared to the Red Bull and the lofty heights that they set themselves because of winning eight constructors' championships in a row. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, they're talking. They're talking the talk now. They're they're uh, starting to beat their chest, saying we're coming for Australia and they're going to see a bit of a change. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not convinced, you know, and already the, uh, the naysayers, the anti Hamilton brigade are actually calling for his retirement. <laughs> it's like, don't say that to the Italian press. Jesus. Well, I've been it's calling start- for that for many years and he showed again by nearly crashing into Piastri every time he tried to pass him. So, um, you know, it's time. It's time. He's too old. Yeah, okay. Oh, we'll see. Oh, you know what? I will change my assessment on that if come 2025, he's in Struggle Street. He's but I, uh, no, nah, he's coming to the land of the Renaissance period, mate. He will be, he'll be born again. He will be born again. We'll give unless, him a new wardrobe. He'll look sharp. He'll feel sharp. It'll be great. Unless for some reason Adrian Newey decides to join your team, nothing's going to change. Watch this space. <laughs> Watch this space. Um, Haas, well, I'll tell you what, K-Mag is the decoy of the millennium and credit to Haas for pulling off a bit of a bit of a strategy to get Hulkenberg into the points. But yeah, they had to do it cheekily to get it. Yeah, and I mean, like we've said, like it doesn't work at any other track. It works at Saudi Arabia because there's no passing opportunities except for, 
you know, the end of the back straight into turn 27 or whatever it is, and then at the end of the front straight. So KMAG rolls around, stores up all his battery, and then deploys it all at one time while the others are fighting over the DRS behind him, and it's pretty easy to defend. So, yeah, they're pretty cheeky, but it worked, and Haas are the ones that are laughing their way to the bank with a few extra or an extra point. Um, yeah, pretty funny to watch, though. I mean, Magnuson, pretty lucky. He really had nothing unlucky, lucky, however you want to look at it. He had nothing to fight for. He had a 10-second penalty. He was always going to finish last. So to cut the track and get another 10-second penalty just to make sure that he stayed in front of Sonoda, um, yeah, very, very cheeky. Pretty pretty unsportsmanlike, but, um, yeah, it's helped his team get a point and he gets a kickstart on the championship. Yeah. The, the funny part is is that he's actually still finished ahead of Sonoda based on the overall standings. <laughs> That's how bad racing balls were uh, over that weekend at Saudi as well. So, yeah, we'll uh, we'll touch on that in a sec. But um, Williams, probably about as good as they were going to be, to be honest, uh, on a track like that. I think um, Albon got a little bit unlucky with uh, his wing damage from the, car, the incident with Magnussen. Um, yep. So I think... Albon probably had more pace than than he showed. He should have more than likely finished um, in the points, but yeah, nursing a damaged car from pretty early on in the race doesn't doesn't help things. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, we'll touch on racing bulls now, and uh, yeah, Danny had a shocker. Danny Ricks had a stinker, and Yuki wasn't that much better. Yuki was in the thick of it with uh, as we've touched on with with Haas, but. Danny was was nowhere. Yeah, it's it's a bit of a mystery that one. Um, he had a pretty lonely race. He could barely even hang on to the back of uh, like the train that was forming behind Magnuson when Magnuson was driving so slow and way off the pace. And then to have such a lazy spin coming through turn one and two all by himself, um, sort of rubbed salt into his wounds. Um, back to the drawing board, he's sort of had Perez under all sorts of pressure and. Now with a couple of not so amazing races to the start 2024, um, yeah, he's relieved some of that pressure and, and sort of making Perez's seat a little bit safer. Yeah, it's a pity. <clears throat> I think everyone's had hopes that uh, Danny Rick was going to set the world on fire, but Yuki certainly stepped up as well. So, yeah, it's not going to be cut uh, a clear cut case for uh, Ricardo to take the second seat at Red Bull should they get rid of Perez at the end of the year. So. Yeah, he's got a lot of work to do, and hopefully Australia is going to be that kickstart to, to get him back up to speed. No better place for Danny Rick to come out firing than, than Australia at his home Grand Prix. Mm-hmm. I'll touch on the Australian Grand Prix and the fast that that was in a sec. So um, your team, uh, Sauber, they're uh, they're hanging around. That's about it. They they match the lighting of and the uh, and the Aramco colours of, Saudi, of uh, Saudi Arabia, and that was about as good as it got. Yeah, and, and another slow pit stop as well. So that doesn't that doesn't help things. No, no, not at all. And then you've got Alpine. So Gasly's had a shocker, um, and yeah, Ocon finished thirteenth again, one lap down. But they are in all sorts of strife. They've got a lot of work to do. Um, it's going to take a long time to turn Alpine around. I don't see them being anywhere near the pace uh, in before the summer break. Um, Maybe if they can make some huge gains coming out of the summer break, they might wow a couple of people, but look, I'm not going to hold my breath. And if I was an Alpine supporter or an Ocon or a Gasly supporter, I definitely wouldn't be holding my breath. Mm. Um, Aston Martin, they've got a quick qualifying car. They just can't seem to quite have the pace in the race at the moment. And of course, Lance doing what Lance does best. So uh, it's another written off card to start the season. That's what the second or third in as many Grand Prix. If you even go back towards the end of last year, yeah, so uh, yeah, they've. Um, I don't know. It's have they have they not progressed enough, or have the other teams around them stepped up and got that that bit better at least on the race pace side of it? Because that wasn't their Achilles heel last year. I think that even if you look at the back end of last year, we didn't see them on the podium as often as we did at the start of the season. So I think it's probably status quo for them. Um, and I think that Saudi probably was a step forward. They were able to fight with Mercedes. They were able to be close to McLaren. Um, whereas in Bahrain, they sort of got left behind 
properly. I'd still think they are definitely lacking some some race pace. Um, but yeah, I mean, small steps for, for our Aston Martin. They're not that far away, I think, um, in terms of, you know, where they finished last season. So I think comparatively, they've made probably the same step as people like Ferrari, McLaren and Mercedes. But they obviously still have hopes of being on the podium and getting some more trophies. And that's not quite happening at the moment. Yeah, yeah, definitely. A huge thank you goes out to our podium partner, Procast Race Centre, and our incredible sponsors. Your partnership allows us to continue bringing you this show and dive deeper into the world of motorsports. If your business adds value to the motorsport community, get in touch with us to become a Negative Camber partner. Get ready to ignite your racing passion at Procarts Race Centre, your ultimate destination for motorsport excellence. Our track isn't just a playground, it's a classroom where 25 years of racing knowledge come to life. Imagine having a team of seasoned experts guiding you from the rookie to the pro. Our driver coaching services aren't just about finding those elusive extra tents on the track, they're about moulding winners. With hands-on guidance, racing line tips and data analysis, you'll not only experience the thrill of speed, but the satisfaction of victory. Join us and witness the transformation of your racing game as our expertise propels you to the forefront of the competition. Visit ProCartsRaceCentre.com.au or pop in for a chat at Dirty Research Road Paraka. ProCarts Race Centre, fueling your passion, igniting your potential. Um, now we come to the Australian Grand Prix and the Australian Grand Prix board should hang themselves. I am calling for them to be investigated for the malarkey that is the ticketing situation. <laughs> so it goes like this. All tickets apparently sold out, no allocations available. Uh, you go through $200 of uh, pre-order. You're meant to get uh, an allocation of seats or a selection of seats at your at your choice. That's why you pay the money that you do. We covered the ticketing fiasco on that portion of it last year. About a week or so ago, Australian Grand Prix board comes out and says last minute tickets are available. Sure enough, vacant seats everywhere. And the stands haven't changed. The pricing is different. It's an absolute joke that now people are having to pay $800, $900 for four-day grandstand passes that were theoretically not available or had sold out or weren't allocated when the tickets went on sale about 12 months ago, let's say, give or take, you know, there. How can you do this? How can you then also charge people $200 up front, which doesn't come off the cost of the ticket? It's just to line up your back pockets. Then go on this mad spree of all this media paraphernalia and 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 what have you that your event sold out. It's going to be the largest four-day sporting crowd in Victorian history. And yet you've got vacant seats everywhere. The stands haven't gotten bigger. It's an absolute joke. And I think the Australian Grand Prix board need to hang themselves. Well, it's shit. I can't say that I have any experience of this at all because I've not been one that's been looking for Australian Grand Prix tickets. So I'm going to have to take your word for it and uh, you have your moments of uh, ex- ex- uh, exile here and, uh, yeah, let it get, let you get it off your chest. Oh, look, for me, I'm not going to the Grand Prix this year. If it was up to me, I'd go to Singapore because I think <laughs> Melbourne's an average event anyway. You know, the track they've had to pretty much straighten the track out in order to make it half reasonable to watch from a racing standpoint of view. And even then the racing is average. So it's, it's people that I know that have tried to get tickets, didn't get tickets, have then bought tickets and they've had to go through this journey. And I've been able to see at close hand, the challenges that they've had. And it's just been ridiculous. Like it, it's, you know, and then to, you know, I mean, I can understand the rule of, not letting people go on to the start finish line at the end of the race to watch the podium. Uh, the, the Grand Prix board have stopped the, that and that's fair play considering the idiots that uh, ran onto the track while the cars were still on their cool down lap last year because of the safety cars. So I can understand that and that's just a result of punishment, but how are they, what are the security measures and how they're going to actually stop that uh, from happening would be very interesting to see how that plays out as well. So yeah, I don't know. I think um, 
yeah, the, the way that the Grand Prix is so bored have run the ticketing situation this year has left a lot of people disappointed. But then also there's an element of distrust now too, you know, but all, then just the money to pay for a four day pass to, you know, and then you've got flight. I mean, even the airlines should need to be shot as well. Like to fly to Melbourne, a thousand bucks. Are you kidding me? A thousand dollars just to fly to Melbourne. Yeah. Jesus, Harry, before COVID, it was a thousand dollars. You could fly to Europe in some cases, you know, and we're only going an hour, hour flight if you're from Adelaide. Come on. They do the same thing with Taylor Swift. They do the same thing with Grand Final. They do the same. So it's supply and demand. People are going to pay the money because they want to go. It's as simple as that. (laughs) I've got an interesting story about catching a flight from Maroochydore back to Sydney with a a plane full of Swifties. So that's, that's, I'll save that for another day. But it was very interesting. The, yeah, no expense spare when it came to, uh, to T Swizz. I'm surprised you didn't actually make the trek over there. She's, isn't she one of your, one of yeah. your female uh, admirers? My idol, absolutely. Idol. Well, she, she admires me, that's what you're saying. Yeah, probably. Well, well I don't know. But Maybe. <laughs> she, she, she admires me. I don't go and spend my money to go and see her. Yeah, fair enough. Neither do I. So it's, it's all good. I did see a wax model of her, though. That was probably about as good as it got down at Madame Tussauds. It's probably even too much. Yeah, it wasn't a great wax model of her. I'd be honest. <laughs> Dua Lipa was actually better. Michael Jackson was dead accurate. But um, we'll say that for another day. Um, anyway, we come to Australia now, Albert Park, the uh, rather disappointing, boring five and a half kilometre track that sits in Melbourne. And uh, we come into this race with hope, prayer, salvation, potentially that Red Bull actually lose a race. Or if it's a race that they're going to lose, that it's Verstappen that doesn't actually win, just to give us some hope of a championship. The odds of that happening, yeah, pretty small, I'd imagine. I wouldn't be putting my house on it, that's for sure. The question is this. Will Sergio Perez have a shocker like he did 12 months ago? Yeah, I actually didn't put him on the podium, to be fair. Um, I think so too. Yeah. Yeah. The question is then, who we got for third? Norris. You reckon Lando? Yeah, I don't know. Actually, I, sure. I actually don't even put Leclerc on the podium or Carlos. It's, uh, my podium is Verstappen, Piastri, Norris. Hmm, okay. I'm going to put a Ferrari up there. I think Carlos is going to have redemption from what happened last year. Uh, in actual fact, though, he said the last two Australian Grand Prix for Carlos and Ferrari have been stinkers. Out on lap one uh, in 2022... And then, you know, the uh, incorrect decision of him making contact with Fernando Alonso towards the end of last year where uh, he got done by the stewards. That was bullshit. But anyway, um, so, yeah, his track record in Australia is not great. So if I was going to put third, I'd probably say Charles. Yeah. But then I think McLaren will be a lot closer to Mercedes will probably be average. They'll probably, like Aston Martin will probably occupy the bottom half of the top 10, I'd suggest. And then maybe we'll have a Smokey in there somewhere as well. Yeah, I think, look, Aston Martin and Mercedes will fill out the top 10. I don't think maybe even the Racing Bulls might be fighting for some points, but um, but yeah, I don't think we're seeing too many changes, especially in the first couple of places. What's your wild card? <laughs> um, yeah, look, I reckon my wild card is probably that Ricardo is going to score big points. So hmm. maybe inside the top six. Hmm. My wild card <laughs> is that someone that's non Red Bull starting on the front row against Max decides to go hero or zero, locks the inside of his brakes, and decides to take Max for a waltz through the sand trap a la 1997 and Jacques Villeneuve, where Villeneuve got pole by 1.2 seconds and his race lasted 200 metres. That'd be, maybe, be maybe interesting. Not, yeah, maybe not Ralph Schumacher epic levels of flying over the cars and landing into the sand trap, but I'm thinking someone's going to just go hell for leather, overcook it and send Max off. That's my prediction. Well, we'll see if that comes true in a couple of weeks' time. 
I did get excited when Lewis and Max were behind each other at Saudi Arabia during the race, and I thought, "Ooh, this is going to be interesting. My wild card's going to come true." Didn't last long enough. <laughs> Max has Couple so much more shifts. speed than everybody, and it's it's over and done with. Yeah, exactly. It lasted long from third to fourth, and that was about it in the shift. So, yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on Albert Park? I mean, you, I've made mine pretty clear. Do you rate the track at all? I mean, I'm assuming you've driven it on the sim. No, I don't. Uh, I don't rate it. I don't rate the changes to it. It's again, it's another car, another track that doesn't have many many stops. Um, it's just all flowy and yeah, not very exciting to drive around. Yeah. I think it's going to be the most underwhelming start to a Grand Prix season since 2014. And this will really test the Drive to Survive fans. I mean, Drive to Survive has really been built around and sort of hit that peak in around 2021 between the title battle of Max and Lewis. But the longer this domination goes, the interest is going to start to drop off now, I think. And then what you'll start to see is who are the real devoted fans of F1 and how are they going to stick around. Uh, And I think if you start to see some massive audience drop off and even and numbers start to fall off i think the fia may do some things to spice the racing up a little bit bring that competition in like they did for 2020 going into 2021 they have to yeah i agree but, but uh, what are they going to do there's you know the sprint race has already proved that it hasn't spiced the racing up too much i think the stand the fans that stick around will be the ones that are you know pretty loyal anyway and have been there since day one but there's still mm. plenty enough drama going on or um, sort of in the midfield and stuff so it just sort of depends where your allegiances lie i guess as to where you're following like i watch it and see max running away but i'm still very interested in what's happening for second third fourth fifth and sixth yeah same but i mean Again, we're purists. We watch it for the love of it, not for, you know, the be a part of the in crowd. So, yeah, that wraps up Formula One. We are done with that, mate. Around the world, what do you got? Yeah, well, it's, um, it's <clears throat> bit of a bit of a long one because we're starting the season off, so a bit of a catch-up on everything. Um, NASCAR, we've had four races in the NASCAR Cup and Xfinity Series, but three held in the Truck Series. Had races at Daytona, Atlanta, Las Vegas, and Phoenix, um, but the truck series was not in action at Phoenix. Uh, in the cup series, we've had wins for Willie Byron, Daniel Suarez, Kyle Larson, and Christopher Bell, uh, all drivers locking themselves into the playoff contention pretty early on in the championship, which has taken some pressure off of Larson, as, as we touched on uh, in the last episode. He's looking to run the Indy 500 and the Coke 600 later on in, in the year. Um He's trying to do both of those races on the same day, and that's the last weekend in May. So pretty pretty exciting one to look forward to. In Xfinity Definitely. Series, we've had uh, two wins for Austin Hill. John Hunter Nemechek's had a win, and Chandler Smith has had a win. Um, Shane Van Gisbergen's adapted pretty well to racing in the Xfinity Series. He's recorded two top 10 results from three starts, and in the other start, he suffered a pretty, pretty major mechanical failure. So it's been the strongest start from an international driver so far in the series. So interesting to see as he moves along in the series and these cars come around to race on the tracks for the second time. Um, maybe he, he might be fighting in contention for some wins. Um, in the truck series, we've had Nick Sanchez, Kyle Busch and Roger Carruth um, taking wins uh, early on in this season. Formula E, we've had three races in the Formula E series with uh, races in Mexico City and then two in Saudi Arabia. The race in Mexico was won by Pascal Werlein while the races in Saudi Arabia were won by Jake Dennis and Nick Cassidy. Moto2, Moto3 were in action last night in Qatar, and it was Alonso Lopez and David Alonso who we won Moto2 and Moto3 respectively. Um, It was the first race for both of those categories on the new Pirelli rubber. Um, Pirelli have taken over as a sole tyre supplier for both of those classes, replacing what was previously um, used by Dunlop as a control tyre. In Moto2, the pole man Aaron Kinnett looked like he was going to be hard to beat, uh, but Uh, That was despite a poor start in the 18-lap race. Kinnett returned to the lead on the third lap, but come the sixth lap, his pace had dropped and he started to fade down the order. Lopez took the lead on on that lap six and held firm through to the chequered flag to beat uh, Barry Boltus, what a name, by 0.055 of a second. Um, In Moto3, Alonso carved his way through the pack on the final lap of a chaotic race and launched a raid on longtime leaner Daniel Holgado. 
the Tech 3 gas gas rider Holgado, who started from pole, saw off a number of challenges on his lead and headed the field to begin the final lap, but he left too much room on the inside of the final corner and Alonso picked his pocket, winning margin in that one just 0.041 of a second. So again, just showing that you don't need all that speed to make excellent racing um, with you know two races there covered by less than a tenth of a second. Uh, in WEC, Porsche clinched its maiden victory in the hypercar class of the World Endurance Championship in the seasoning opening round in Qatar, despite encountering some late race drama. Lawrence Van Thor, Kevin Estry and Andre Lederer uh, took top honours in the Qatar 1,812km race, despite Estre having to make an unscheduled pit stop with fewer than 10 laps to go because he was missing, of all things, a number panel on the left-hand side of the car. It was a double win for Porsche in Qatar with the Manthe Pure Racing Squad taking top honours in the new 2024 LMGT3 class. Klaus Backler, Joel Strum and Alexander Malikin led the majority of the race in the 92 Porsche, eventually taking the chequered flag 4.8 seconds clear uh, of the number 27 Aston, Aston Martin Vantage GT3. In IndyCar, Team Penske's Joseph Newgarden won the opening round of the IndyCar series uh, that was held on the weekend on the streets of St. Petersburg. Newgarden led 92 laps. He lost the lead after a slow first pit stop, but battled back quickly to re-emphasise his dominance. O'Ward had the Penske pair of McLaughlin and Power filling his mirrors in the closing stages, and Power began to attack McLaughlin with five laps remaining, but that encouraged the Kiwi to re-engage in his, his attack on O'Ward. The positions stayed as they were, and that was a Chevrolet 1, 2, 3, and 4 in the first round of IndyCars. FIA F2 and FIA F3 have been in action alongside the opening two rounds of F1 held in Bahrain and Saudi. Um, in F2, Zane Maloney was dominant in Bahrain, winning both races, while the races in Saudi Arabia were run won by Dennis Hauger and Enzo Fittipaldi. And in F3 action, there were wins for Harvard Lindblad and Luke Browning. Uh, both of those classes will be in action in Australia alongside the next round of the Formula 1. Good stuff, mate. Good stuff. And speaking of motorbikes, we return to the Peco Show of 2024. And what a win it was. Fifth to second in a couple of laps, so actually straight off the start, and just dominated. Dominated, Harry. Uh, no, truth be told, he had to work for it. And uh, it's going to be a great battle this year between Ducati and KTM. So top results were Peko Banyaya first, Brad Binder second, Jorge Martin, Jorge Martin in third, Mark Marquez fourth, Enya Bastianini fifth, Alex Marquez sixth, Fabio Di Giantonio in seventh, Alex Espargaro in eighth, Pedro Costa in ninth, and Maverick Vinales rounding out the top ten. Uh, Jack Miller finished... 21st Nowhere. and last out of all the current runners. So Jack doing Jack things. In fact, he actually finished behind Luca Marini, who had a shocker in the Honda as well. So Honda is still struggling. Zarco actually rounding up the top 12 and Quadraro in 11th position as well. So, yes, great start for those that love Peko, mainly me. But, um, yes, great, great way to start 2024. And Jorge Martin doing what he does best, and that's taking pole positions and winning the sprint race on the Saturday as well. But we don't worry about Saturday events, Harry. Sunday's payday, mate. That's what you keep telling us. It's only early in the season, so let's not you know, get your hopes up too much because Pecco will just do Pecco things and fall off the bike again. Oh, fuck, he gave it a complete... Ooh, sorry. <laughs> he gave it a pretty close run of ending his life last year, so I can't be any worse, could it? No, surely not. Surely not. Surely not. All right, I think that's about it. I, I think we've pretty much covered everything that we need to cover so far. So um, we need to, we'll need uh, we start to get some guests on the show now. We've got a bit of a lineup that we have to work our way through to, pending availability. So uh, it should be very interesting. We cover all, all spectrums. We go open wheeler, we're doing rallying, we're doing a bit of V8s, we're doing all sorts of stuff. So it's, uh, yeah, 2024 is now well and truly underway. Absolutely, and I think we'll be back on board again in the next couple of weeks to uh, to do supercars and uh, Formula One from Australia. Well, mate, have fun over in uh, in Gambia. Don't be uh, don't be the tool. Be the man that wields the spanner, as I say. So, uh, yeah, fingers crossed that yeah have some success. But definitely keep us in the loop as to the racing. And if you do happen to 
find out why on earth they've decided to go down this path in terms of timed races, then by all means, give us the good word and let us know. We will do for sure. All right. That's all we got for uh, this week, folks. Good night and uh, when, see you soon. You've reached the checkered flag of another episode of Negative Camber the Motorsport Show, proudly brought to you by Pro Karts Race Centre. A huge thank you to you, our incredible listeners. Your support and passion for motorsports fuels our enthusiasm to bring you the latest results, analysis and interviews from the racing world. Keep that FOMO at bay by subscribing to Negative Camber on your favourite podcast platform. We'd also love it if you could leave us a review and share the show with your fellow racing enthusiasts. Your feedback and support mean the world to us. Remember, Negative Camber is more than just a podcast. We're a community of dedicated fans who live and breathe motorsports. Follow us on socials, join us on our website, negativecamber.co, and be sure to subscribe to the Negative Camber Club for access to exclusive content, episode previews, and special deals from our amazing partners. Until next time, stay fueled with passion, embrace the negative camber, and keep chasing those podium finishes.